buongiorno. Eh, siamo qua per la conferenza stampa del film Dune, fu presentato fuori concorso. E al tavolo, a partire dalla destra in fondo, Javier Bardem. Oscar Isaac. Rebecca Ferguson. Il regista del film Denis Villeneuve. Timothée Chalamet, Zendaya e Josh Brolin. Um, I'd like to start uh, with a question, just to break the ice with to, uh, to Denis, uh, because uh, I understand that this book has been with you for a very, very long time. And, um, and so what is it that made it so important for you when you were young and now? I kept saying to the cast, push the button. <laughs> I think that uh, it, uh, um, as, as a, when I read it as a kid, I was like uh, struck by uh, uh, Paul's journey, uh, 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 the way he finds his identity, comfort into another culture, uh, his uh, relationship with nature, and uh, um, his feeling, this melancholy and this beautiful feeling of isolation that the character was going through uh, and uh, struggling with all this heritage, the weight of an heritage on his shoulder. That's something that deeply moved me that, uh, at, at art at the beginning. This question here. Uh, hi, this is Matiz Maitsen from RTV Slovenia. I have a question for Timothy. Uh, the character of Paul Atreides has already given us one iconic performance, namely uh, by Kyle MacLachlan in the David Lynch film. So I wondered, uh, while you were preparing for the role, did you use that performance or as any kind of template or inspiration, or did you prefer to stay away from that as much as you could and build something that is completely your own? Your own? Thank you. Yep, sorry. The latter, because uh, that was loud, sorry. Uh, huge respect for Kyle's performance, and I love that version, and I watched it uh, about two months before we started shooting. I've been fortunate enough to work on other projects that have had prior iterations with great actors in them. And I have huge respect for all of them, but when Denis Villeneuve asks you to do a movie and do his version of a movie, you forget all that and you make yourself as humble as the source material asks you to be. And uh, I guess just went at it like that. There. Hi, Stephen Shaver here for the Boston Herald. Uh, Denis, I wonder what when you got to do this massive movie, which is called part one, what did you find was your biggest challenge actually? And secondly, because it is part one, what is the benchmark uh, when we'll find out we can have part two? The biggest challenge doing Dune was by far uh, to deal and master with Timothy's hair. No, no, no. no. Because it's 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 alive, and and I had to direct and Timothy and I had to direct his haircut, and uh, you guys don't know. Okay, sorry. The, the 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 biggest challenge I will say was to try to find a balance between there's the the the, the book is so rich, and it's a book that takes all its strength into its details, and. Uh, uh, it was really to try to, um, to find an equilibrium between the information that uh, someone that doesn't know the book at all, uh, the, the amount of information that the, 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 this, the audience that don't know the book, the, 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 the amount of information they will need to understand the movie without crushing them with exposition and uh, trying to be, of course, as cinematographic as possible. So it's like, a, um, that was the, the big challenge, not trying to find the right ex, a, a amount of, of uh, information so the audience could follow the story correctly and uh, follow this adventure. Um, about the benchmark, that uh, I'm not the one who will draw the line. <laughs> I just, I think that uh, one thing for sure is that the, the and Warner Brother and Legendary uh, uh, are proud of the movie right now and uh, um, putting all their efforts to, uh, to bring it to the, to, to the world on the big screen, which I'm very happy. And um, we'll see how it goes. I mean, uh, hopefully, so at the end of the day, these are, of course, difficult times. 
for for everybody and uh, uh, we all agree safety first i mean uh, but uh, if uh, the audience feels uh, comfortable and uh, in a, there's a safe environment i encourage them to to see this movie on the big screen because it has been dream it has been designed it has been made it has been shoot shot sorry uh, thinking IMAX thinking and the sound design, everything. It's it's a, when you watch this movie in, on a big screen, it's almost like a, a, an IMAX. It's, all, it's a physical experience. You know, it's a, we we try to design a movie that will be as immersive as possible. So that's why I, I uh, and for me, the big screen is part of the language. Voilà. Hello, I'm Pepa Blanes from Cadena Ser Radio, Spain. I would like to ask uh, to Javier Bardem, uh, because Doom, I think, in my opinion, talks about one of the most important problems today, environment. You are a green activist, and I wonder if for you it's important that movies like that talk about uh, this. Uh, if my colleagues don't, uh, didn't, don't kill me, I ask you if you could uh, answer in English and in Spanish, please. <laughs> if you don't mind, of course. Uh, in English and in Spanish will take a lot of time, no? Uh, first in English, I think, yes, the, the movie, it's, uh, the author was ahead of his time and he was already concerned about how the world was going towards uh, in the sense of uh, losing the capacity to uh, have, his, have us all in good health uh, as long as we uh, violate its limits. And here, he, here we are today dealing with that, thinking that it's something that is going to happen in the next future, but it's happening as we speak, which is kind of scary. It's on the governments, it's on the big uh, corporations, the solution to really make a big step ahead and really change our minds about how we behave in this world. Uh, and, and it's a change of style, of lifestyle for all of us, and it's, uh, it's kind of uh, scary. Uh, but it's either that or, <laughs> or a disaster, as the people who know say. Uh, so my character in this movie things that way as well, and he's defending the environmental aspect of the planet in order to at least make it, his tribe, his people survive. And I was absolutely, uh, I don't know, linked emotionally or conceptually uh, to that uh, color of the character immediately when I read it in the book and when I read it in the script. So it is important that in a movie like this, uh, Denis and uh, the whole crew, the whole uh, people have made this amazing movie tells that part of the story because it's one step more in the right direction. En español no puedo porque si no sería demasiado. <laughs> Gracias. Por tiempo me dicen. Gracias, perdona. Um, hello, uh, Kuriko from Japan, eiga.com. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Villeneuve and uh, one question to Ms. Zendaya and uh, Mr. Sh uh, Chalamet. Uh, to Ms., uh, Mr. Uh, Villeneuve, um, I have an impression that uh, this film is uh, politically very um, relevant today. So I, I would not say um, it's message, but there is a um, political context uh, subject in it. So could you talk about uh, the process of uh, adaptation? And a question to uh, Ms. Zendaya, uh, how about your uh, haircut, hairstyle? <laughs> I'm joking. Um, how, what, <laughs> sorry. Um, what, your, your presence is very, very um, big impact. So how do you prepare to this role? And one question to Mr. Chalamet. Um, this is very epic story, and uh, you, your presence is very, very um, strong in the whole movie. So, uh, personally, what does it mean to you, this movie, and uh, what impact do you think in your career? Thank you. To start quickly, I will say that uh, as when Frank Herbert wrote Dune in the, in the 60s, 
back then uh, it was he was like uh, uh, doing like a portrait of the 20th century but i think it, it, it became more and more through time like prediction of what will happen in the 21st and sadly it, uh, the book is more by far more relevant today about the blend of uh, uh, the danger of the blend between the cross mix between uh, religion and politics the the the, the danger of mess messianic figures the the impact of colonialism the the um, as Javier point out uh, uh, the the uh, problem with the environment and I, I uh, and uh, as this book stayed with me through the years but it just felt more and more and more through time more and more relevant and um, so I think that uh, sadly uh, I wish it was not the case but I think the movie is, uh, is uh, it's, it will speak uh, to the world right now uh, more than it would have done uh, 40 years ago, I will say. Yeah, I will say that about the environment to, to uh, add to what Javier said, I think that uh, um, future generations will judge us. I think it's time to get angry right now. I think it's time to, to, to push, to make changes. I think it's, there's, it's, 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 it's I, I still have hope, and I, I think that it's time to, to get into action. I think it's like there's an, an uh, as an example, there's an election in, right now in Canada. They don't talk enough about environment. That should be the priority. That should be that's that's the thing we should talk about in the in this election right now. And they don't talk about it that much. It's just like another subject that should be the subject. Anyway, I don't want to be moralistic. I just think that's a, it's about survival, and that's what this book is about, surviving. Hi. <laughs> um, well, I I, um, I didn't really get much time to, to shoot with these amazing people, some of which I got to meet today. Um, and I was extremely, uh, I guess you could say, intimidated because obviously there's so many people here that I admire. And then um, the opportunity to work with Denny, I think um, he's an extraordinary filmmaker and has always been someone that I, I, I also admired. So stepping into that, I was like, I don't have much time and there's so many people that I have to hopefully stand next to and do somewhat of a good job, you know, and it, it was intimidating and scary. But as soon as I got there, there was such a, um, a warmth and an, an embrace that I felt um, immediately comfortable and taken care of. And I, I, all I had to do was be guided and, and Denny opened up and explained the world to me and, and was able to, um, to do that in, in, a, in a short amount of time. And everybody was so welcoming and it was a beautiful experience. I was only there for a few days, but um, I felt like I had been very quickly a part of a family. So um, yeah, I appreciate all of you guys for making it such a wonderful time and, and I feel extremely grateful to just to just be a, a, a piece of this really um, gorgeous <laughs> puzzle that, that is Dune, you know? So I, yeah, very, very humbled and it was a special, special time, but uh, just trusted him. I'm gonna try to go quickly too because I know we gotta get to some other questions, but uh... Simply put, this was the honor of a lifetime for me. And I like how Zendaya just put it, in some way I just had to be guided, even though it was a project size I hadn't been on before. And every person, every artist I'm fortunate enough to sit up here with right now, and maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I was able to lean on each one emotionally at some point over the course of these a four or five month shoot. These are all actors I've seen in projects that I admire, that's not Actors blowing smoke, that's really, my, if we had a, more time, I can have a longer conversation about it. And now I'm proud to call these, you know, my sisters and brothers, if that's our, with everyone up here. I hope we get to do a second one, that would be a dream. And yet in some way I'm simply grateful for the experience of doing this. And Josh Brolin said it beautifully this morning in a different interview, when you make, the process of making the thing is different than the than the putting it out. So there's three versions of the movie. There's a movie you read, there's a movie you make, and there's the movie they edit. And now there's the movie we're putting out there. So hopefully people go see it, but this has already been a dream come true. 
Speaking, speaking of guidance, I'd like to bring in the conversation Rebecca Ferguson and, and, um, and Oscar Isaac, who, are, who play Paul's, uh, Paul's parents. And uh, you, uh, Oscar, you have the power of war, and uh, Rebecca, you have the power of the mind. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between your characters and, and, and Paul? Um, yes, hi, hello. Uh, <laughs> war, I don't know, I, I feel like uh, what... what um, Duke Leto brings, um, which is maybe very specific, is uh, in some way he's the most recognizably human, meaning he has no special powers, he has no, um, um, uh, he, has, he has nothing that is, uh, that none of, that any of us don't have other than being the ruler of, the, <laughs> of Caladan. So, um, you know, and, and, and the fact that he is, uh, he is, He's knowingly marching towards his demise uh, and knows that, and that's from the book too. I mean, from the second people start talking about him, they're saying, you know, he's not gonna make it. <laughs> and, and yet there's still this tension about what he's gonna do and is he, if he's gonna continue. And, um, you know, not to get too highfalutin about it, but it's very similar to we all know that we're gonna die, yet we still have to continue and make choices. And, and so I think as far as a figure for his son, um, trying to bring some sense of humanity and nobility, and nobility not in the blue blood kind of way, but nobility in terms of seeking a higher level of consciousness and a higher way of, of, um, of leading a nation and of leading a people, especially coming into this place. Like, how do you, how do you inherit all of this ugliness and all of this evil and all these machinations that are out of your control and uh, try to move towards a more noble state of being. And I think that's, his, that's the big thing that he's trying to give to this son that has been prophesied to be some messiah or something. But as far as he's concerned, as long as you can hold on to that humanity and the higher idea of humanity, you'll be okay. Um, and it's an interesting dynamic between the two of them. That was something we had to talk a lot between uh, Rebecca and I about how much do they know about what each parent is doing? How much does he know about all of this, um, you know, manipulations over the centuries and what this means? You know, it starts with this thing that she was supposed to have a daughter and she, she gave me a son instead. <laughs> you know, she broke the rules out of some sense of love. Um, is it, you know, is it because it was a sense of love or is it because she already knew it was time for this Messiah, Messiah to show up? Um, so it's just, a, it's amazing, because the more questions you ask, the deeper and deeper and deeper it goes. Hello, hello. Um, I, uh, it's so interesting just listening to the interviews that we're doing and um, listening to other people's answers, because what I love is you can do films and you can ride along, I feel, on other people's description of character description or emotion, and I feel we all have our own identity, really and truly in this. We all have our own relationships to each other and to the spice and to, you, you sort of, you can't just ride along. I mean, for me, or well, for Jessica, it's such a mind game and an emotional one as well, that balance of, of being a mother, but also having such a strong belief in something greater than just being a mother. And one isn't better or doesn't sort of outsmart the other, but you know, she, she comes from this sisterhood, the Bene Gesserit, who are there to manipulate the outcome of the universe, basically. And then conflicted with this passion and love for her belief. And also, I believe, we spoke a lot about true love. What happens when you fall in love? Um, and the request of, of creating a son versus my, my chores. Um, which one do you go for? You know, it, it's a constant struggle. And you say mind, I mean, this is her entire identity. It's, it's the mind struggle, but the emotional protection of, of children, of your child, of your loved ones, and knowing what is right. It's, um, and finding those lovely balances. Thankfully, I had a director helping me from one emotion to the other. I was quite confused sometimes. Um, but yeah. But just to speak to Denis as well, you know, it was something that we constantly and constantly spoke about. Um, and trying to find that balance and how, you know, uh, how much we reveal of what they know um, and looking, you know, 
constantly going back to the book and talking about scenes and what, what can we add, what do we not need, how can we deepen the feeling of the family and particularly the, the emotional battle between duty and you know, love of your family, wanting to keep your family safe. Nicely said, Oscar. That was good. Thank you. I was just looking at you for approval. And Rebecca. The whole time. <laughs> yeah, um, hi, Helen Barlow from Australia. This is a question to Josh. I saw the Stephen Colbert, Colbert um, thingy me question thing with a lot of you, and you were like the class clown. And every time your name is mentioned, Timothy smiles. So were you the kind of the, the, the class clown on the set? And, and it's hilarious that your first line is, I am smiling, when you're not smiling. And how was it to play this stern military man, given that you are this gregarious kind of person in real life? And how was it on the set? I apologize, madame. Josh is not allowed to speak. <laughs> he put it in my contract. Um, Wow, man, there's so much to say. There's so much intelligence up here that I can't match. Um, I think uh, I was on set as Denise's friend, and I was somehow worked into the movie. I don't even know. I haven't read the book, so I don't know if the character is actually in the book. <laughs> but I'm paid to make people laugh, apparently even in dramas. Um, so I have the power of the testicles in this movie. Yes, I said it. And that's what I represent. I'm here to protect the Duke. That's all I know. I'm listening to all these, what I find fascinating in all seriousness, which is very difficult for me. Um, what I find fascinating is what we created before we started the movie is not what we're experiencing now. You know, you have ideas of what this was and what Frank Herbert Jr. created. I just for a moment imagined Frank Herbert Jr. listening to us right now and to think, like, would he be proud? Is this what he intended? Was he talking about this when he was talking to Alan Watts in the 60s? Was he imagining us when he did LSD in the 60s? Um, whatever it is, he saw, but I he saw you for sure. He <laughs> for me, he, saw you. he imagined he saw only a me. A big Brolin, yeah. huh? LSD and a Brolin. But he, uh, I think he intended something very powerful. And I, when I saw the movie, that's what I saw. You know, uh, I know we're kind of supposed to talk away from kind of the fandom of Doom, but. When I saw it, when, when, it, when the movie was screened for me, I brought somebody who was a, a major fan and had read the series probably three times over when they were very young, eight years old, nine years old. And we screened the movie. There was a long pause afterwards, and this man is 48 years old and from New York City. And he started screaming at the top of his lungs. And he said, that's what I saw. That's what I saw as a kid. Yes. Yes, yes, you know. And when you see that kind of a reaction, um, you realize it hits somebody on a, on a very visceral level, you know. Allows for regression and allows for, for something else to happen other than just a cinematic spectacle. Bonjour, c'est Louis-Philippe Ouimet de Radio-Canada. Une question en, en français pour euh, Monsieur Villeneuve et Monsieur Chalamet. Bon, c'est un rêve d'adolescence pour vous, M. Villeneuve, le, le roman d'une. Vous vous êtes beaucoup identifié à Paul Atreide, hein? « Fear is the mind killer ». Comment tous les deux vous avez travaillé, parce que vous parlez de, de frères et sœurs, de fraternité, d'un amour en, avec le réalisateur. Donc, M. Villeneuve et M. Chalamet, comment vous avez travaillé ensemble, entre autres pour la, la fameuse scène du gomme jabard qui, qui est assez émouvante? Là. Comment, quelle symbiose vous avez installé ensemble? Un, déjà la langue, et on peut plaisanter sur ça, mais franchement, d'avoir une, une euh, tunnel de communication qui était unique pour nous, ça me, ça me rassurait. Mais, mais après ça, je dois dire, euh, le, je ne sais pas comment dire, le niveau de seriousness que Denis a approché la matérielle, que euh, souvent dans les, les films ou les adaptations sci-fi, 
on essaie d'ajouter tellement d'éléments et tellement de, de, de trucs qui sont intéressants. Et là, j'avais l'impression que Denis voulait l'opposé, que l'environnement était vrai et qu'il voulait les personnages et leur behavior d'être euh, vrai aussi. Et par rapport à la scène de Gomjabar, c'était une prescription comme acteur de mettre la main dans une boîte où on se dit « That's the most pain you've ever had in your life ». Alors, c'était des deux côtés, d'essayer de faire le rôle du côté réaliste, mais aussi de me mettre dans les mains de Denis et d'avoir la confiance que, où il voulait que j'aille, de me mettre à fond, de « not question it » et avoir tout le, toute la confiance qui, qui est facile d'avoir avec Denis. Je dirais que, que Timothée est quelqu'un qui a un intellect très fort, qui est, qui est intellectuel, qui, qui a, et qui a voulu, dès le départ, qu'on a approché le scénario, on a discuté, on a beaucoup discuté. On a eu beaucoup de discussions intellectuelles sur, sur, sur le film, mais sur le plateau, mon rôle était de, de rapprocher ça, d'aller dans la viscéralité de la scène, puis de, 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 de les, les idées étaient installées dans la scène, il fallait aller s'enfoncer dans dans, dans l'émotion, et Timothée m'a fait confiance, je dirais que je crois c'est une, une des premières scènes qu'on a fait ensemble, et je fais le fait qu'on travaillait avec euh, 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 Charlotte Rampling, euh, la grande Charlotte Rampling, qui, 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 qui était absolument magnifique, qui était, et en fait, on, qui, qui, nous, qui nous terrifiait aussi. On avait peur de Charlotte. Qui faisait peur aussi, parce qu'on ne voyait pas son visage, et elle venait. Non, non, mais ça, ça aidait beaucoup, je pense, ça a été, et, et c'est là que, c'est dans cette scène, vraiment, que, que, que le personnage de Paul est né. Um, c'est là que j'ai vu tout le, le génie, toute tout la, la, la puissance euh, d'acteur de Timothée où, euh, dans un plan précis, je me souviens très bien, euh, où le personnage doit devenir possédé. C'est presque un exorcisme. Exorciste, pardon. Où le personnage devient comme soudainement possédé par une force intérieure qui ne soupçonne pas, qui vient de son inconscient, qui vient d'ailleurs. Et c'est un moment où Timothée, son regard... Son visage s'est littéralement transformé devant la caméra. Il y a quelque chose, il y a une, il y a une, il y a une charge qui est sortie. Et, et je me souviens de, de, que je, je, à ce moment-là, je pleurais de joie, puis je, je me suis mis à danser derrière la caméra parce que je me disais, ça y est, j'ai un film. Je ne me suis pas trompé. <rire> est, il est Paul. J'étais tellement heureux. Sorry. Hi. Um, first of all, um, congratulations that you finally got to um, screen the film. And I have a question for Timothy, uh, actually. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the sand walk and perhaps demonstrate it? <laughs> Alors, uh, uh, with a wonderful, one of the best choreographers in the world, Benjamin Milpier, who is a director in his own right, who actually came up with the sand walk. So the first video I think Rebecca and I would have gotten was a video of him on Santa Monica Beach in Los Angeles doing the sand walk. I'm afraid if I did it right now, I'd be in rhythm and this whole room would be devoured by a sandworm. Uh, so that's a bad joke. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that was, uh, that was, a, that was a, another thing in the, to the question we just had in French. That was something that Denis dealt with in a very grounded way. So on set, it wasn't something that, you know, not that we were being too precious or too self-serious, but it was something that was like, hey, let's not be uh, goofy about this. Let's really get this right. And uh, Rebecca, correct me if I'm wrong, we had the scene in Abu Dhabi, and, and uh, I think we found the dialogue to it afterwards, but we had to walk down, and, and hopefully we see TikToks, people doing the same walk and stuff, no. I'm going to jump in. I remember thinking, oh, I need to study this, and then I thought, no, thank God, I'm not supposed to know it. I can get away with not knowing it and look silly. <laughs> I think we have time for one more, and she's been waiting. Hello, um, I have a question for Ms. Mr. Villeneuve. Um, you have mentioned before the soundtrack, uh, the biggest sounds. Um, I was wondering, have you, uh, before the movie, the idea of making the music with Hans Zimmer, or did you came along uh, the movie? Actually, when I decided to make this movie, Hans was the very first artist I asked to to come on board. Uh, at the time, we were uh, uh, finishing Blade Runner, and I remember having a conversation with Hans, and he, and he uh, if I may, uh, uh, he, he said uh, to me, uh, you know that it's one of my biggest dream to score Dune. It's so, so much of a dream that I didn't watch any anything Uh, he did never watch the previous movies, he never watched anything uh, because he wanted to stay 
virgin, like, uh, and, and he wanted, he said, I hope one day. And uh, we both, uh, he came to Montreal and we had a nice dinner and, uh, and uh, we had a discussion about, is it a good idea to try to bring to life one, your, one of your oldest, one of your most precious dream? Is it a good idea to try to do that? And we were not sure of the answer, but we, we did it. And the thing is that Hans uh, uh, started to dream. I remember he gave me his own copy of the book. He said, bring the book in the desert with you. It would be good, good for the, the, the soul of the movie. His, his old uh, Dune book. I, I kept him with me and he, we, we he started to, to work for months and months and months and months of exploration. He wanted to bring new sounds. He wanted to go out of his uh, comfort zone. He wanted to approach music in a different way. And uh, strangely, the pandemic came and, uh, and strangely it, it forced him to, to find new ways to also to, to uh, interact with, with, uh, with the singers and uh, that were uh, everybody, all the, the instruments, all the singers, everybody were trapped in their own houses. And sometimes you had those insane, the best singer on earth that were singing in their own closet, you know, <laughs> trying to, it was like beautiful to see everybody in their own little bubbles and bringing all this score from everywhere and, and creating all this, this uh, we had one thing that we decided right from the start is that it should be a feminine score to enhance the feminine presence that, that we felt was very, very, very important and fundamental in the book. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it was something that uh, we both agreed to bring the female strength from the score uh, as well as we did in the screenplay. Voila. I'm sorry, but I'm told that we run out of time. Thank you, our guest. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the film. In Call Me By Your Name, Timothy Chalamet wore an earpiece while shooting the fireplace scene so he could listen and react to the song that would be played in the actual movie. The earpiece was ultimately CGI'd out. Now what's your favourite movie starring the actor? Let me know in the comments below. Do you like my shirt? You can get one for yourself in the link in the description.